once you've downloaded the document, open Kami, <coughs> drag and drop. You should be seeing it for the first time, so you shouldn't be getting that message. That's a little clunky the way that inserting the images went. Uh, so just know that you'll have to jump down, moving on to that next page. Reviewing our objectives, the one that is clearly what we'll be working on in this set of notes is motivations. Right. And they could be about support or opposition to globalization. In this case, it's really going to be about support for globalization. And our old friends, the three Gs, are back. God, gold, and glory. And we are going to examine each of these motivators in order. Of course, when we talk about God as a motivator, motivator, we're talking about religion. When we looked at this previously, it was done by the Spanish and Portuguese monarchies in cooperation with the church. And this is different. This is done by missionary societies. And the nature of Christianity being spread is going to be different. This is going to be Protestant Christianity, right, as symbolized by this cover of a book celebrating 100 years of the Baptist Missionary Society, right, highlighting their work done in tropical parts of the world, right, in Asia, And that puts it in contrast to that early, uh, earlier religious spread because previously it was Catholicism. Right? Spain and Portugal, Catholic monarchies, closely tied to the Catholic Church. And so that was the Christianity they spread. This is Protestant, and this, often detached from government, uh, at least in the beginning, is really about people who wanted to save souls. Yes, Brina. Uh, let me get through this and then yes. This doesn't mean that they are angels themselves or saints. Right? A lot of this we will also see carries some of the kind of racist um, and condescending views towards native peoples. But they were, in many cases, uh, probably most cases, genuinely motivated to save souls. And that's illustrated by this map of the Protestant Missionary Society. Um, this map of the world is color-coded. Yellow shaded areas are Protestant. Red shaded areas are Catholic. Green uh, would be Muslim. And then we have these great dark gray shaded areas that are referred to as heathen. And they note uh, their estimate is 834 million heathens. And their idea here is if they don't go out and give them the word of Christianity and get them saved, then those heathens right, will go to hell. So they are pretty sincerely motivated. And this will contribute to globalization in several different ways most obviously, will simply spread religion. It is why today, if you want to find some of the most vigorously Christian groups of people, you can find them in Africa and places like South Korea, where missionaries went and spread the word, and the people um, really accepted it enthusiastically. But they also spread other aspects of European civilization. Importantly, languages. 
I do want to be clear, this is not entirely a one-way transfer of language. The missionaries did often go to a lot of work to learn the indigenous languages. As demonstrated by this Bible translated into an indigenous African language. But the primary spread of languages in terms of the language that the missionaries taught to indigenous people. Which is why in many countries of Africa, English is the primary language spoken, or French in some cases, Portuguese and a few others. They also spread other aspects of culture. Now, this would be too long of a list for us to go through, uh, so we'll use um, two related examples of European cultural standards. One is the sense of modesty, and I don't mean uh, modesty in the sense that Dakota might say, well, I mean, I'm an okay baseball player. Right? It's not the same as humility. What we mean is right, modesty in the sense that you go around fully covered up with clothes. And so, of course, that second element is clothing. Right? Illustrated in this image, right? we've got indigenous people. Right? The males are not wearing shirts. Right? The females are wearing uh, short dresses. Right, with short sleeves. The missionary women showing up are wearing long sleeve, high neck dresses that go clear to the ground. Right. Not much is shown. And that was something that they certainly tried to spread. And you can see that as change, as clothing changes in colonized countries. And the third way um, is what cynical folks will like to point out, and they're not wrong in pointing this out. The missionaries and religion often became very much intertwined with imperialism and colonialism. Two examples will serve our purposes here. The first is what was known as the Bible and the flag for the British Empire. The idea that these two things moved in sync with one another. And it was because the monarchy was very much linked to Christianity. Right? This image, this postcard, um, right, no, actually, book, sorry, that's a library stamp. Um, faith, king, and empire, right? With faith first, God save our king and queen, very much linking the two together. Another example comes from the United States and Hawaii. The missionaries become the owners of sugar plantations. Not, not necessarily in a single generation, but what might have happened is that uh, Brody goes to Hawaii as a missionary. And then Brody's son is like, well, dad seems to have this church thing pretty much running itself. Uh, so I'm going to go into business. Looks like a good place to grow sugar. I'm going to buy some land. Um, and Brody's son is going to become quite wealthy. And as he gets wealthier, he's going to want a little more influence over what happens in Hawaii. Um, but he's a foreigner in Hawaii. Hawaii is its own independent country. It has its own government. It has a queen. Brody doesn't like this, or Brody's son doesn't like this at least. And so Brody's son and other sugar growers descended from missionaries push for the United States to annex Hawaii. Now you're going to learn more about this. You should learn more about this in your U.S. history class next year. But in this case, annexation means um, taking a piece of foreign territory and adding it to your own state. You may have learned about this in middle school. 
uh, with the annexation of Texas. And this story is symbolized by this political cartoon of a shotgun wedding between Uncle Sam and Hawaii. The preacher represents the missionaries, and the man holding the shotgun represents the sugar plant. Next up is the gold motive. And this is where things are going to get a bit more complex because there are three different ways about thinking uh, or three ways of thinking about the economic motives for globalization 1.0. We'll start with familiar territory. Mercantilism, mercantilism, whatever you want, want to call it. Despite the ideas of Ricardo and Smith, the leaders of a lot of powerful states still wanted to be autarkies. Remember, an autarky means being self-sufficient. Right, they wanted to keep out foreign imports. They also wanted to sell as much as possible to other states. Remember, for mercantilism, the idea is to build wealth by selling stuff to other people and not buying much of their stuff. Empires were important for this. One, if you, can, if you conquered a new territory, Instead of having to buy raw materials from somebody else, you could just get them from your own colony. Right? Basically, you could get it in-house. It also helped them with exporting manufactured goods. And it's important to understand in this process, raw materials are never worth as much as manufactured goods. Right? Even if we take something that is valuable, Right. Valuable straight out of the ground, like gold. That gold is still worth more if, let's say, Derek is a jeweler, right? turns it into an awesome ring. Right? Just a drippy, blingy ring with lots of ice right? and lots of gold. Right? Derek has added tremendous value to that. Right? Same story here. And if you've got an empire, you've got more options for selling those manufactured goods. You can still sell them to other states, but you can also sell them to your own colonies. And the Brits were pretty like, shockingly honest about how this worked. In one of their Buy British ad campaigns, they said empire products for Britain, right? mostly we're talking about raw materials, going to Britain, and then being sold back to the colonies in the empire after the Brits had manufactured them into more valuable stuff. We also see it illustrated in these political cartoons. So first, just another example of you know, the patriotic be British and buy British. All right. Also note here that we've kind of added a twist to mercantilism. This isn't just about what's good for the country. All right, it's, well, I mean, Dakota, makes cars, right? makes Land Rovers. Um, and if you buy British, you're helping Dakota stay in a job, right? and be able to put food on his table for his kids. Right? How many kids have you got, Dakota? 22. 22, my goodness. Right? Uh, someday when you're older, you are going to have to watch Monty Python's explanation of Yorkshire and what happens with babies there. All right, but only when you're older. All right. This other, what's that? You don't want to know? Well, by the time you get to 20 kid, 22 kids, there won't be any surprises left, Dakota. All right. uh, yeah, so this, what I mean, is the example. The colonies provide the raw materials, the food, the gold and the silver, and the queen representing the mother country and is the one who gets to enjoy all the profits uh, and all the bounty of the colonies. 
All right. Now, don't be too quick to judge or judge the Brits too harshly. Right. Uh, America does this too. Right? And I could keep putting other presidents up here with Buy American initiatives. Um, they're also not that new. Right? We've got this lovely political cartoon that's, oh, probably about 130 years old. Um, about America's tariff wall. And here we've got a sugar grower right, telling Cuba that they can't sell their sugar here. Right? We produce our own. Right. Now on to some new ground. Right? One of the other explanations for how economics motivated globalization is Marxism and Marx's claims about the inherent flaws or contradictions in capitalism. Marxism, of course, gets its name from Karl Marx. And this theory is all about class conflict. primarily between two classes, the bourgeoisie or the capitalists and the capitalists are the people who own what Marx calls the means of production. Those are things like the factory where Dakota works right? or the mine that produces the iron ore that becomes uh, the crankshaft in the engine that Dakota assembles. And these capitalists buy other people's labor. Right? Labor is not part of the means of production. Be careful with that. The means of production is the stuff it takes to make things. Labor are the people who actually use the means of production to turn one thing into another. And the capitalists or the bourgeoisie are the minority. Right? Uh, they're a very small part. Right? They would be the 1% that you often hear American politicians on the left talking about. The other maiden class is the proletariat. Right? They are the working class. Right? And right, what Marx tells us is that all they've got is labor. Right? They don't have anything else. Now, in many cases, they don't own their own tools. And because all they have is their labor, right, they have to sell labor cheaply. Right? The capitalists get to buy it cheaply because labor has to sell it cheaply. Right? And the working class, they would be your 99%. Right? They are the vast majority. This class conflict, uh, the class conflict, the class relations, and the mode of production, which is capitalism, is what Marx calls the base of society. Uh, it's the foundation on which everything else is built, everything else grows out of that base. And that everything else is what Marx calls the superstructure. Now, those of you that have ever been interested in the Navy right, or maybe model ships, right, think of an aircraft carrier. Right? You've got the big flat top where the planes take off, and then that tower that sticks up out of the side is called the superstructure. Right? Same thing. Right? That image helps you for Marxism. Use it. If not, forget I said it. That superstructure includes things like politics and government. Right? All of it comes out of class conflict and you should know that the government it has the back of the capitalists. As illustrated by incidents like this in American history, where workers uh, rose up and usually the factory owners um, could call in the militia, what today would be the National Guard, or in some cases actually 
federal U.S. Army troops uh, to come in and break up the strikes, sometimes shoot the strikers. Culture and art right, also reinforce the dominance of the capitalists by showing us that the bourgeoisie really are the ones with the best values and we should try to be like them and respect them. Right, don't ask me why their children look like creepy miniature adults. Don't know. Um, but look at them. I mean, they're fine, upstanding citizens. Right? They've brought us all of this great stuff, the ships, the buildings, right? all of it. Right? We should want to be like them and respect them. Education is also about this. Right? Um, can you guys take a business class while you're here at Central? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Claire, are you taking one right now? All right. Uh, can you take a class in how to start a revolution? N no, I mean, this one can kind of be that, I suppose, but that's not its point. Uh, can you take a class on how to or organize labor so that maybe you can lead the next union vote at an Amazon warehouse? You can't? My gosh, they've got us too. Right, and they do. I mean, that's what Marx would say. Right? And I'm not advocating for a class on revolution or uh, like rabble-rousing 101, but Marx would say, look, your education system will teach Claire how to be you know, a part of the capitalist system. It won't teach her to fight it. And also famously for Marx. If you guys have ever heard a Marx quote, this is probably it. Right. Die religion ist das opium des Volkes, or in English, uh, which is in your notes, religion is the opiate of the people. Uh, sometimes translators like to give it a dramatic flourish and call, say, religion is the opium of the, or the opiate of the masses. Right. And the idea there was that um, religion helped support the capitalist system, right. um, especially if we're talking about uh, maybe Catholicism. Right. And Marx is a German. Uh, there were a lot more Catholics in Germany than in England where he did most of his writing. Right, and remember, Catholicism told people, hey, life on earth is supposed to be rough. Right? That's Adam and Eve's fault. Right? They ruined it for the rest of us, and now we have to suffer in this life. Uh, and if we do it right, we get to go to heaven when it's over. So Dakota, yeah, your hours in that factory are long, the working conditions aren't great, and the pay stinks, but right, that's your lot in life. Right? Suck it up, son, deal with it, and when you die, you get to go to heaven. Um, and so Dakota's like, okay, that's my lot in life. I'll just suffer through, and in the end, it will all be better. Okay. And based on that, it should sound like the capitalists have this on lock. But they don't. Because capitalists might sound like a tight-knit little club of the one percenters, but they have to compete with each other. And to do this, they do two things, both in an effort to cut costs. One, as much as possible, they replace people with machines. Right? Now today we'd show you like a robotic welder arm, right? but in this image, right, it's other machines. Right. And this lets you lay off members of the working class. Right. So far, so good. Right? More machines, fewer people, you cut your costs. But as you keep laying off the workers, you end up with a problem. Unemployed people don't have money to buy the stuff that you make. So what do you do? Well, you cut more costs. Right? You automate even more. You put more people out of work. But eventually you end up in what's called a vicious circle. Right? Or, if you're wanting to be fancy about it, a negative feedback loop. you get to this point of extreme unemployment, right? Just as symbolized by this right, sign telling jobless men right, to keep going, right? that community has no work for you.
And eventually, this vicious circle spirals out of control and reaches a critical point, and that's when we get the communist revolution. The working class, right, the proletariat, take over, and they give us communism, right? or also known as socialism. Right? Uh, I mean, and that's what they would have called it. But often in this country, it gets kind of confused. Right? And for our purposes, we're just going to sum up communism as this idea right? that everybody will work according to their ability and everybody will take according to what they need. So if Morgan is a manager at Dakota's now not Land Rover factory, but the people's uh, off-road vehicle factory, and Claire, or Morgan is the manager, right? uh, Morgan, how many kids do you have, Morgan? Four. Four, right? Guess what? You don't need as much as Dakota. So even though you're the manager, right, you've got responsibility for making sure that the factory's running smoothly, everything's going well, you're turning out a quality product, you're not going to get as much stuff as Dakota. Right? Because Dakota's got 22 kids, and let's face it, right? he needs it more than you do. Right? That's communism. You can't say, well, Dakota, you just should have stopped making babies, but that's not how this works. Right? He needs it. He gets it. Uh, you don't, and so you don't get as much. But, of course, there was no communist revolution, no Marxist revolution during globalization 1.0. Almost, right? Kind of close. And we get the first one in 1917, but that is three years after globalization 1.0 is over. For that answer, we need another Marxist. Right? Probably the second most famous of the Marxists, Vladimir Lenin. Uh, that guy. And he argued that imperialism was what he called the highest stage of capitalism. And by that, he meant the final stage of capitalism. He argued that as long as capitalist states could keep taking over new territories to colonize, they could continue to get cheap raw materials, and they could continue to create new markets where they could sell stuff. Even as they're exploiting people and putting them out of work, they're still going to find more people they can sell stuff to. As long as they can keep that going, they could put off the Marxist revolution that was inevitably going to happen. Marx and Lenin believed that the revolution really was inevitable. It was just a matter of time. It would either happen sooner or later, but it was going to have to happen someday. Boiling that all down is how this is a motivator. Well, this the flaws of capitalism, the vicious circle of competition and cost cutting is what drove the imperialism we see in globalization 1.0. Yeah. Before we head off to lunch, I'd be able to wrap up the economic motivations, and it was circling back to Smith and Ricardo and their arguments in favor of free trade. Um, there was actually some of it in this time period. Uh, in fact, quite a lot. And it came from Britain and the United States, even though there were still obviously um, powerful, powerful uh, mercantilist forces in both countries. Both of them also worked in many ways to support free trade. One of the ways they tried to do this was by the open door policy in China, which again, you'll learn more about in US history, but the idea here was that we were going to keep 
the door to China open for everybody to trade with that country. So you've got Uncle Sam, you've got the British Bulldog, and then, of course, the racism just can never stay away for too long. Uh, the little dog is Japan. Right? It does not get to be a big dog. But that was all about free trade. And, again, the Royal Navy went to a lot of trouble to keep the seas open for everybody. It didn't just keep the seas safe for British shipping. It kept the seas safe for American shipping, French shipping, kind of like the U.S. Navy does today. All right. We're going to take and returning for our third G glory. And this is all about the grandeur right, of empire building and possessing an empire of vast colonies. Now, it seems that it's easy to dismiss this as just, you know, really not a significant part of the story of what motivated globalization 1.0, um, but the ability to, to brag about what was in your empire, right, and the prestige of having an empire was really important, uh, not just to the leaders of countries, right? uh, the kings or queens or emperors or kaisers um, who might have been the face of a nation, right? but also the common people, um, the average citizen, were um, often quite proud of the empires their countries possessed. And so we really shouldn't discount that. Um, one of the ob most obvious examples of this, of course, is uh, the United Kingdom, which was able to boast uh, the biggest empire the world had ever seen and has ever seen and to be able to claim that it was so big that the sun never set on it. Um, and as another example, just to show, in some ways this could be seen as the pettiness of the glory motive, right? but petty doesn't make it less important. I think we can all recall moments in our lives where somebody's petty actions uh, had quite a significant effect on us or someone we know. In this case, the pettiness is on the part of Germany's Kaiser, um, which is like their king, their emperor. It's derived from the Roman Caesar uh, for the name for the title for an emperor. And this is Kaiser Wilhelm II right, in reference to the border of German East Africa. The border did a weird zigzag around Mount Kilimanjaro, allotting Africa's tallest peak to the Kaiser. His grandmother, Queen Victoria of the United Kingdom, had the Hindu Kush and the Himalayas and any other number of big mountains. The Kaiser had none and wanted a big mountain of his own. So again, it seems petty, but it had a consequential effect on uh, colonization and the carving up of Africa. And so we should think of empire as an important status symbol um, for countries during the era of globalization 1.0. Uh, we've got some more symbols to indicate this that are also included in your notes document. Canada postage stamp. The areas in red are the British Empire. And this is Christmas 1898. We hold a vaster empire than has been. And so there's never been a bigger empire. And you can see Canada's proud to be a part of it. They've put themselves at the center in that portrayal. This map right, shows the flags of a free empire, showing the emblems of British power throughout the world. And, of course, the wreath with all of the crests of the British possessions, and an empire on which the sun never sets. And not to leave out America, right, it shows kind of the growing, uh, quite figurative and literal, uh, growing of the United States as an empire. 
right, becoming quite this decadent uh, end point here. Now, that previous image, we should back up to that. It may seem to be unflattering, and I think in many ways it is meant to be, right, but also in this time for someone to be uh, so portly was a sign of wealth right, and that you didn't, uh, that you could eat your fill and live a life of leisure. This, plainly more flattering. Right? It shows America right, uh, as a young woman, Lady Liberty, right? and she's trying on a hat. Right? And the hat is called World Power, and it is symbolized by um, a battleship, right, or a destroyer or a cruiser. And what would be a plume of feathers from a normal hat is, of course, coal smoke from the steam boilers for that ship. Right? And in that smoke, we can see the word expansion. Uh, expansion is a part of this new proud hat for the United States. And again, empire becomes a status symbol in this era. And notice right, the caption, Columbia, which is the name for another name for Lady Liberty. Uh, Columbia's Easter bonnet, Columbia's Easter hat. All right, that concludes our notes on the motivators of globalization 1.0. Look forward to seeing you in class. Please be sure that you upload your completed notes to the assignment.